In this lesson, we're going to do a basic review of theorems relating to circles. So let's start with a circle. And let's draw a line segment. A line segment in a circle, which extends from one point on a circle to another point, is known as a chord. So we have chord AB. Now let's draw the radius in such a way that it's perpendicular to this chord. So let's say this is the center of the circle, point C, and then this is point D and E. So you need to know that if CD is perpendicular to AB, then CD bisects AB. So if CD is the perpendicular bisector of AB, that means that AD and DB are congruent. And if that's the case, that means that D is the midpoint of AB. So that's one theorem you need to know. So anytime that you draw the radius of a circle in such a way that it's perpendicular to a chord, then the radius bisects the chord into two congruent parts. And a point of contact represents the midpoint of that chord. Now let's say if we have a circle and if we draw a chord that passes through the center of the circle. So let's say we have chord AB and it passes through point C where C is the center of the circle. That chord is now known as the diameter. The diameter of a circle is equal to twice the radius. So CB represents the radius of a circle and AC represents the radius of the circle. So this is also the radius of the circle. Anytime you draw a line segment between the center of the circle and any point on the circle, that represents the radius of the circle. Now, if you know the radius of a circle, you can easily calculate the circumference and the area of a circle. The circumference of a circle is 2 pi r, and it represents basically the perimeter around the circle. So that's the circumference. The area of a circle is pi r squared. So we need to calculate the area of the shaded region. You could use that formula. Now let's talk about congruent chords. So let's say if we have a chord here and another chord here. And let's say this is AB and chord CD. Let's say we have center E. Let's call this F and G. So let's say that EF is congruent to EG. What's true? You need to know that if two chords of a circle are equally distant from the center, then they are congruent. Because EF is congruent to EG, that means that AB is congruent to CD. Now, let's say that EF is perpendicular to AB. That means that EF is the perpendicular bisector of AB. So AF is congruent to FB. And if EG is perpendicular to CD, that means that CG is now congruent to GD. Now let's talk about arcs and central angles. So let's say that point is the center. So let's call this A, B, C. So we have a circle with center B. Now angle A, B, C is known as a central angle because the vertex is on the center of the circle. So B is the vertex. Now you need to know that the measure of a central angle is equal to the measure of the intercepted arc. So angle ABC and arc AC have the same measure. So let's say that angle B is 60. That means that arc AC is also 60 degrees. 
Now, arc AC is a minor arc. A minor arc is less than 180. A major arc is greater than 180. So a central angle is usually associated with a minor arc. A semicircle has an arc that is equal to 180. So let's say if we have some point X, which I'm going to put that in red. So the major arc would be arc AXC. You need three letters to determine direction. So this is arc AXC. It's greater than 180. Arc AC, you don't go this way to go from A to C. You take the shortest path when you have two letters. Arc AC is 60. So arc AC is considered to be the minor arc. Arc AXC is the major arc. Now, if you wish to calculate the major arc from the minor arc, it's 360 minus the measure of the minor arc. So 360 minus 60, that means arc AXC is 300. Now let's talk about tangent lines and secant lines. A secant line intercepts the circle at two points. So in this case, at point A and point B. A tangent line touches the circle at exactly one point, and I just missed that circle, so let's do that again. So this would be a tangent line. It touches the circle at point C. Now let's say if we have center D, and if we draw the radius of the circle to the tangent line, it's going to meet at right angles, and this is always the case. So let's say if we have another circle, and we decide to draw the tangent line right there. So if you draw a segment between the radius, I mean the center of the circle, to the tangent line, which represents the radius of the circle, then it's going to meet the tangent line at a right angle. They will always be perpendicular. Now another theorem that we need to keep in mind is the two tangent theorem. So let's say if we draw two tangent lines which extend from a common endpoint. So let's say that common endpoint is point B and we have a center D. So this represents the radius of the circle and this is also a radius of the circle as well. You need to know that the two tangent segments segment AB and segment CB, they're congruent. So they're the same. Anytime you have two tangent segments extended from a common endpoint, those tangent segments will be congruent. Now AD and DC represents the radius of the circle. So those two are congruent. Therefore, the radius will always meet the tangent segment or tangent line at right angles. In this case, we're dealing with tangent segments. Now you can prove that A, B, and C, B are congruent using the hypotenuse leg theorem. Notice that they share a common side, D, B. So using the HL theorem, you can prove that A, B, and B, C are congruent. You also need to use C, P, C, C, C. Now the next term we need to talk about are tangent circles. So what exactly are these things? Two circles are tangent to each other if they intersect at exactly one point. So let me draw some pictures that will illustrate this. So those two circles are tangent because they intersect at this point right here. And here's another example. those two circles intersect at this point. So these are tangent circles. Now on the left, those two circles are internally tangent to each other. And this is because one circle lies inside of the other. On the right, the two circles are externally tangent to each other because each circle lies outside of the other. But they're still tangent circles because they intersect exactly at one point. Now the next topic that we need to review are common tangents. So what are these exactly? 
A tangent is common to two circles if both circles lie on a tangent line. So let's draw two circles. Now, here's one tangent line. It's not a perfect line, but we'll make it work. So let's call that tangent line AB. So notice that that tangent line touches each circle exactly at one point. And let's draw another one. So that tangent line touches those two circles at one point, C and D. So those are common tangents. They're tangent to two circles. It could be more than two circles as well. Now, tangent line AB is known as a common internal tangent. And the reason why it's called that is because that tangent line lies between the two circles. Tangent line CD is known as a common external tangent because it does not lie in between the two circles. So those are some terms and definitions to know. Now let's talk about angles and arcs. So early in this video, we talked about a central angle. In this case, central angle ABC, where B is the center of the circle. And AB is a chord, BC is a chord. So we said that if this angle is 50, the arc has to be the same measure. So arc AC is 50. So the central angle and the measure of the intercepted arc are the same. Now, instead of having a central angle, what if we have something known as an inscribed angle? What do we need to know about this? So what exactly is an inscribed angle? So in this case, we still have an angle formed by two chords, but the vertex is not at the center of the circle. Rather, the vertex is on the circle. So what's the relationship between the inscribed angle and the measure of the intercepted arc. The measure of angle ABC is going to be one half the measure of the intercepted arc AC. So let's say if arc AC is 100 degrees, half of that is 50. So angle ABC will be 50 degrees. Now let's say if we have an inscribed angle and also we have a central angle where both angles have the same arc. So let's say this is A, B, C, and this is D. So notice that the two angles have the same arc, arc AC. Now, if angle D is 80 degrees, what's angle B? Well, we know that the measure of a central angle is the same as the measure of the arc. So arc AC has to be 80. And the inscribed angle has a measure that's one half of the measure of the intercepted arc. So half of 80 is 40. So therefore, the relationship between the central angle D and the inscribed angle uh, B is as follows. So angle D is twice the measure of angle B. So anytime you have an inscribed angle and a central angle, and if they share the same arc, then the central angle will be twice the measure of the inscribed angle. Now, there's another angle that we need to talk about. Okay, I'm not sure what just happened there. Sometimes this laptop has issues. It's the tangent chord angle. So what exactly is this angle? Well, as the name suggests, it's composed of a tangent segment and a chord. So let's call this A, B, C. So B, C is a tangent segment. A, B is a chord. Now the measure of angle A, B, C is also going to be one half the measure of the intercepted arc. In this case, that's arc A, B. So this is the intercepted arc. So let's say that angle A, B, C is 60 degrees. So the arc has to be twice the value. So arc AB is going to be 120. So therefore, angle ABC is half of 120. Half of 120 is 60. 
And so that's another theorem that you need to know, or just a simple equation that you have to know if you're going to have a test on this stuff. Next up, we have the chord, chord angle. So this particular angle is formed from the intersection of two chords. So let me draw a picture. So here we have a circle, and here's one chord, and here is the other chord. So let's call this A, B, C, D, and E. So angle A, C, B, and D, C, E, they're congruent because they're vertical angles, and vertical angles are congruent. Now you need to know that the measure of angle A, C, B, it's one half the measure of arc A, B, plus the measure of arc DE. So basically, it's the average of those two arcs. So let's say that arc AB is 100 degrees, and arc DE is 60 degrees. What's the average of 160? Or what is the middle number between 160? That's going to be 80. So if you use the formula, it's going to be 1 half of arc AB, which is 100. Arc DC has a measure of 60. So 100 plus 60 is 160, and 160 divided by 2 is 80. So a chord-chord angle has a measure that's the average of the two intercepting arcs. Now the next angle that we need to talk about is the tangent-tangent angle. Now this particular angle lies outside of the circle. and it's formed from two tangent segments. So let's say these two. Let's call this point A, B, C, and let's say this is some point X. Now the measure of the tangent-tangent angle, B, which is formed from tangent segment AB and CB, remember a tangent segment touches the circle exactly at one point. So the measure of angle B is going to be one half the difference between the major arc, which is arc AXC, minus the measure of the minor arc AC. So as an example, let's say arc AC is 110 degrees. What is the measure of angle B? Now there's also another theorem related to the tangent tangent angle and that is that the minor arc and this angle are supplementary. I think it's a good time to talk about this special theorem. So arc AC and the measure of angle B adds up to 180. So angle B is simply 180 minus 110 which is 70. But I'm going to confirm that using this formula. Now the first thing you must realize is that the measure of the minor arc, AC, and the measure of the major arc, AXC, notice that they complete the entire circle, which means that they add up to 360. So the measure of the major arc, AXC, is going to be 360 minus the measure of the minor arc, AC, which is 110. So 360 minus 110, that's 250. So that extends from a through x all the way to c. So now we can use this formula to calculate the measure of angle B. So angle B is going to be one half the measure of the major arc which is 250 in this example minus the measure of the minor arc which is 110. So 250 minus 110 that's 140 and 140 divided by 2 is 70 which confirms this answer. So you have two equations that is related to the tangent-tangent angle situation. Now let's review the formula for the secant-secant angle. So like the tangent-tangent angle, this angle also lies outside of the circle. And the formula is similar to the formula of the tangent angle. So first let's draw a picture. So we're going to have two secants which extend from a common endpoint, and that is going to be endpoint C. So recall that a secant line touches the circle at two points, and the same is true for a secant segment.
Now, here's the formula that you need to know. The measure of arc, or angle C rather, is one half the difference between arc AE and arc BD. So let's use an example. Let's say that AE is 110 and BD has an angle measure of 60 degrees. What's the value of angle C? So the measure of angle C is going to be 1 half 110 minus 60. Now 110 minus 60 is 50 and 50 divided by 2 is 25. So in this example that's the angle measure of angle C. Now let's move on to the secant tangent angle. Now like the previous two this angle is also it exists outside of the circle. And it has a similar formula and it's composed of a tangent and a secant segment. So let's call this A, B, C, D. So DC is the tangent segment, AC is the secant segment. Now the measure of angle C is one half the measure of arc AD minus the measure of arc BD. So let's say that arc AD is 200 degrees. And let's say that angle C is 30. What is the measure of arc BD? So this is arc AD. And we need to calculate arc BD. So angle C is 30. Actually, let me put this up here. And that's equal to 1 half arc AD, which is 200. And arc BD, the stuff that we're looking for, let's call it X. So now we got to do some math. What I like to do is multiply both sides by 2, just to get rid of the 1 half. Half times 2 is 1. Now 2 times 30 is 60. So what I'm going to do is take this, move it to that side. So it's going to be positive x. And then I'm going to take this and move it to this side, where it's going to change from positive 60 to negative 60. So x is going to be 200 minus 60. So therefore, x is 140 degrees. So that's the measure of arc BD. It's 140 degrees. Now something else that you need to know is that if you have two inscribed angles and if they intercept the same arc, the two inscribed angles are congruent. So let me give an example to illustrate this. So let's say this is angle A and here we have angle B. And let's say this is D and E. So if this is x and this is 40 degrees, what's the value of x? So let's draw it one step at a time. So let's focus on angle A, which looks like this. Now it's not drawn to scale, but we'll make it work. So angle A is 40 degrees. So what is the measure of arc DE? Remember, the inscribed angle is half of the intercepted arc. So the intercepted arc is twice the inscribed angle, which means this is 80. Now let's focus on angle B, which also intercepts the same arc, and that is arc DE. So arc DE is still going to be 80 degrees, which means the inscribed angle is half of that, so it's 40. Therefore, x is 40. So as you can see, B intercepts the same arc as A, angle A. So therefore, these two angles are congruent. Now another statement that we need to know is that an angle inscribed in a semicircle is a right angle. So let's draw some pictures to illustrate this. So let's say this is the diameter of a circle. And here we have, let's do that again. Here we have a triangle. This is going to be a right angle. Now it doesn't matter how we draw it because we can draw it different ways. So let's say this is also the diameter of a circle. We could put in the middle. This will still be a right triangle. Or we can draw it like this. That would still be a right triangle. Now why is that? Well, if this is the diameter, then the intercepted arc is half of the whole circle. 
the angle for a full circle is 360. Half of 360 is 180. So that's the intercepted arc. And the inscribed angle is going to have half the measure of the intercepted arc, which is going to be 90. Half of 180 is 90. So anytime you draw a triangle that is part of the diameter, which forms a semicircle, that triangle is going to be a right triangle. Now let's say if we have a circle, and inside of this circle, we have a quadrilateral. So we could say that the quadrilateral is inscribed in a circle. So we have quadrilateral ABCD with center E. Now, what are some theorems that we need to know if we have a quadrilateral inscribed of a circle? You need to know that the opposite angles are supplementary. So let's say if angle A is 70 and angle B is 105. What's the measure of angle D and C? So A and C are opposite angles. So that means that they're supplementary, which means that they add up to 180. So angle C is going to be 180 minus 70, which is equal to 110. Now, B and D are opposite angles, so they must add to 180. So the measure of angle D is going to be 180 minus 105. So 180 minus 100 is 80, and 80 minus 5, that's going to be 75. And so that's how you can calculate the opposite angles if you have a quadrilateral inscribed in a circle. So a polygon is inscribed in a circle if the vertex, if all the vertices of the quadrilateral or polygon is on the circle. So we can describe it both ways. We could say that quadrilateral ABCD is inscribed of circle C, I mean circle E rather, or we could say that circle E is circumscribed about polygon ABCD or quadrilateral ABCD. Now let's talk about the chord chord power theorem. So let's draw two intersecting chords. So let's call this A, B, C, D, and E. And let's say that segment AC is A and CE is B. And BC is C, CD is D. So the formula that relate those segments are as follows. A times B is equal to C times D. The product of the segments of the two intersecting chords are equal. So that's the chord chord power theorem. Now the next one we need to talk about is the tangent secant power theorem. So let's call this A, B, C, D. So DC is the tangent part. BC is the external part of the secant. And AC is the secant segment, where DC is the tangent segment. So the formula that you need to know is that tangent squared is equal to the external part times the secant segment. And so that's for this tangent secant power theorem. Now the last power theorem you need to know is the secant secant power theorem. So let's call this A, B, C, D, and E. So AC is secant 1, EC is secant 2. BC is the external part of secant 1, and DC is the external part of secant 2. So you need to know that E1 times S1 is equal to E2 times S2. So that's the secant secant power theorem. Now there's two more formulas that I want to mention. So let's say this is the center of the circle and we wish to calculate the arc length, which is represented by the symbol S. And that is from point A to point C, where B is the center of the circle. And let's say we have theta in degrees, and we know the radius of the circle, which is BC and AB. The arc length is going to be theta divided by 360, where theta is in degrees, not in radians, and times the circumference of the circle, which is 2 pi r. The area of the sector, which is the shader region, 
is going to be the fractional part of the circle, which is theta divided by 360 times the area of the entire circle, which is pi r squared. So those two formulas can help you to calculate the arc length and the area of the sector or the shaded region.